the good Imperial. Yes, I do exist. For those of you who follow Imperial lore closely, you know the stories of selfless men and women who would gladly give their lives for the Galactic Empire. They represent a different vision of what the Empire could have been, a true force for stability, peace, and justice. An efficient and strong central government which speaks of unity and compassion but has the strength to destroy external threats, corruption, and crime. But of course, these good Imperials are just living a lie. Every Sith-related faction eventually shows its true colors. Hidden beneath false promises of security and riches are the same toxic and chaotic mentalities that are the opposite of what you want in governance and in the culture of society. Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. There's something rotten with how the Galactic Empire did things. And it's neatly hidden beneath the slick gray uniforms and utilitarian durasteel bulkheads of the Imperial Navy. Outsiders looking in might be wowed by all of the awe-inspiring displays of military hardware and strength, but the underlying culture of the Galactic Empire actually comes from a much more ancient philosophy, one devised by Dark Jedi, who turned away from the light and created the Sith. In this video, we're going to take a close look at Sith philosophy, which has secretly inundated almost every aspect of Imperial governance. It's not something widely talked about because the image the Empire likes to give off about itself is that it is an efficient technocratic government based on law and reason. And not some batch crazy ancient cult ideology. If you take a close look at the Empire, you can see the Sith influences everywhere. From the wedge-shaped Imperial-class Star Destroyer that Palpatine claimed in his Sith Compendium was inspired by the ancient Sith Herrer-class Dreadnought, to the statues of the Four Sages of Duarte in Palpatine's office. They've been there since his Chancellorship days, and it really points towards his appreciation for some of the more controversial thinkers in galactic history. It's also where he stored his lightsabers. Now, out of the four statues, the two philosophers who flanked his desk and were therefore the most important to Palpatine were the philosopher Ciceros, who favored pandering to the masses and weaponizing populism for selfish gain, and Brato, who was well-versed in the code of the Sith. You see, if the Jedi didn't spend so much time preventing their followers from learning even like the basic information about the Sith, maybe they would have sniffed out that something was wrong with Palpatine from the very beginning. Now, the Sith Code is actually pretty simple. I mean, it doesn't take much time to decipher, although we could probably do a video on it one day. At its core, it's the antipathy to the Jedi philosophy of total control over one's emotions and more natural desires. We'll get more into the nitty gritty in the following sections, but at its core, this is an ideology that was actually a reaction to the Jedi ideology. The Jedi Code, which is also quite flawed, was at least founded in a relative vacuum. Legends say the roots of the Jedi stem all the way back to the Tython system, which was cut off from the rest of the galaxy by galactic anomalies. And so the Force ideology created by the Jedi was specifically made to help individuals overcome the many challenges they would face on their way to becoming a powerful Force user. Whereas the Sith ideology was created as a reaction to all of the persecution and tolerance they received from the Jedi. And so when you see lines like, through victory my chains are broken, the force shall free me, it's not just about freedom in a symbolic or even metaphysical way. Whether the Sith realize it or not, it's actually a lot about freedom from the Jedi Order. Because the original Sith were all originally Jedi who were exiled. Before we continue today's video, a word from our sponsor, Ownersaber.com, the premier place to get a premium lightsaber legally and not from some Sith cultist. Here we are. Of course, this is a judgment-free zone. But might I remind you that a good portion of Jedi turn into Force ghosts, and so uh, aiding and abetting anyone who's looting their bodies might not be a great idea. For the month of May, Onasaber.com is giving away four lightsabers for free. On May 12th, at an unknown time, they'll be releasing 100% off discount codes on their YouTube channel and Instagram. They'll be giving away two dueling lightsabers and also two premium Xenopixel lightsabers. If you guys want to join this competition, subscribe to their YouTube and Instagram channel, and then tune in on May 12th and wait for that code to pop up at a random time. Also, all of Xenopixel's premium blades, like this Kenobi replica, the first on, will be available for 30% off. 
So thank you for your patience and on to the rest of the video. You'll never see the Sith Code written anywhere in an Imperial military handbook. You'll never see it talked about or even mentioned in an Imperial Academy. As a matter of fact, very few individuals in Emperor Palpatine's own inner circle even knew that he was a Sith Lord. But I can imagine seeing the first line in the Sith Code, peace is a lie, being written over every Imperial naval bulkhead door or stormtrooper barracks entrance. Because it genuinely is a decent message to be teaching young men and women we were trying to train to become defenders of your faction. Peace is a lie means several things. Taken literally, it means that the natural state of the galaxy is chaotic and perhaps one should always be prepared for violence. In the civilian world, if you acted like that, we would just call you paranoid. But if you are in the military, it's actually not bad practice to think like this. The Sith like to laugh at the Jedi's pursuit of peaceful existence. But the reality is the Sith and Jedi are pursuing very similar things here. I mean, peace is a lie basically means that stagnation is death. And so in life, we should always strive to constantly challenge ourselves and not become complacent. Both the Jedi and the Sith do not stray away from challenges. They actually love it. They try to become better fighters, better force users, better tacticians in times of war. And while the Sith openly embrace chaos and violence, what they don't understand about the Jedi's pursuit of peace is that this is also a never-ending struggle. So this idea of not shying away from conflict and struggle and reframing it as a positive way to grow is an excellent thing to teach the young people, especially people who are in the military. This is always the part the Empire got right. The entry-level test for Imperial Academy placement was brutal. And the placement test for entering an elite Imperial Navy Academy for flight and command school was even more challenging. It actually wasn't uncommon for cadets to die during training and not just from accidents. And during more ancient times in the Sith Empire Academy system, death was an accepted part of the selection process. Life must compete in order to flourish. Such is the natural way of the universe. To stand still is to know death. One must always be moving forward. So it is the same amongst the Sith. Compete or die, mercy is irrelevant. The Empire created an extremely efficient pipeline for vetting out the weak, unskilled, and unmotivated. And while there was a lot of corruption, this was pretty common in most Sith societies, you also had great examples of meritocracy working in the form of individuals like Sienna Ree, who came from a very poor family on a very impoverished and isolated Outer Rim world. She would rise through the ranks in the Empire solely on her own merit skills and hard work. Another great example of this is Ray Sloan, who also came from a poor family in the Corps. Through sheer skill and determination, she would become the highest ranking admiral in the Imperial Remnant. And so the statement that peace is a lie is the reason why Imperial pilots were amongst the finest in galactic history, and far superior to their rebel counterparts. Now things get a bit rougher the deeper you get into the Sith Code. Their passion I gain strength simply means that emotion can be used to push an individual to become stronger and overcome any situation they face. But this really should be a Sith only passage. Sith Lords gain more force powers by using their emotions. Darth Vader was rumored to always be in pain because of the gruesome injuries he suffered from and the cheap fit of his armor. He used that pain or passion to create anger, which then fueled all of his insane powers. On the battlefield, a soldier who is an extremely emotional will at best trigger a bit of adrenaline to keep him fighting. And at worst, it'll cause him to do something stupid like expose his unit by disobeying an order to hold fire until given command, or something really stupid like, I don't know, charge the enemy and try to kill him with a vibroblade. These Rambo types are universally hated in the military and they don't really last long on the battlefield. Interestingly enough, this aspect of the Sith Code is not seen within the Imperial military. There generally is good discipline amongst the rank and file. But relying on brute strength alone can be a real big problem, especially if that means you're going to ignore the recruit that might be brilliant, but is physically or mentally weak. An extreme adoption of this peace is a lie mentality without any compassion towards less capable individuals can limit who you can recruit. I mean, does it really matter if your navigational officer can't bench 300 pounds? But I guess the Sith were always a bit high strung and paranoid about stuff like this. 
they always had this mentality that they were on some desert island with limited resources, and so they always called the weak. In certain organizations like the Stormtrooper Corps, for instance, which was primarily an elite infantry organization, brawn and loyalty was favored over being an intelligent fighter. This further creates a problem with your officer corps. You don't necessarily want the strongest and best fighters in command positions. You want your best leaders and smartest tacticians. Yeah. Okay, here is where the largest problem with the Sith ideology lies. Right before the end where they talk about freedom, they talk about how strength leads to power and power leads to victory. It's this idea that power is the only pathway for the Sith to reach their ultimate goal of victory. Not power through cooperation, but power through individual strength. Now there are rare cases where the Sith will band together when facing a stronger foe like the Republic and the Jedi or the Yuzang Vong. But because peace is ultimately a lie. When the Sith have no foes to face and are in charge of the galaxy like they were during the Galactic Imperial period, then the constant need for a power struggle is directed towards other individuals who have power in their vicinity. And that becomes a problem when the only people in the vicinity are other Imperials. I mean, this is a good mentality for a prize fighter, but terrible for a military culture where coordination and cooperation is key for the institution's success. I mean, competition is necessary for great results. I love a market economy with balance and regulation. But the type of competition we see in the Sith is just pure chaos, usually leading to infighting, civil war, and massive losses of resources and life, which is why the Republic and the Jedi always end up winning against the Sith Empire in war. And even when the Sith begin to win, they usually just self-destruct by fighting each other. This is one of the main reasons why Darth Bane started the Rule of Two ideology. Bane surmised that if there was more than two Sith at any time, they would just end up destroying each other once again. Now this idea of power at any cost was really embraced by the Empire as a whole. Before the Rule of Two period, during the Brotherhood of the Sith's reign, the Academy on Korriban was where the best Sith recruits were sent. The amount of training deaths that occurred here would make an old Spestance gunny proud. Or is that just propaganda? And to be clear, these trading deaths weren't just the result of accidents or stupid live munition trust exercises or whatever the hell this is. In many cases, it was just straight up murder and dominance by stronger students. The teachers even encouraged cheating and deceit and murderous behavior by not heavily pursuing the perpetrator if they were smart at covering their tracks. It appears, my dear, that some tests are fairer than others. I wish you luck. We actually would see a similar mentality within the Imperial Training Academy system as well. It wasn't just about being competitive, it was about being ruthless, even to your peers. Now, during the Galactic Empire's time, power at any cost wasn't an official policy, but Palpatine surrounded himself with ruthless individuals with very power-hungry tendencies. He generally would allow anything to go as long as his subordinates were loyal to him. It's almost as if he enjoyed watching his underlings fight and tried to kill each other. I mean, Moff Tarkin tries to kill director Orson Krennic for control of the Death Star. Sly Moore tried to kill Vader for more power. And of course, Vader tried to kill everyone, including Palpatine. This is really what you don't want from your ruling council. These are supposed to be advisors who specialize in different parts of governance and not at killing each other. The problem with Palpatine's mentality here is that individuals good at backstabbing and being cruel are not necessarily competent leaders or advisors. I mean, take Moff Wilhelm Tarkin, for instance. He always showed a ruthlessness worthy of a Sith or a tormented child who was thrown into the wilderness naked and unarmed, surrounded by giant alien lions. And a quick look at his career shows us that this very damaged individual is far from competent. Tarkin was captured in the Clone Wars and sent to a supermax prison for Jedi. In the interwar periods, he lost an extremely expensive prototype ship that had advanced stealth technology to a bunch of rebels who carried out multiple terrorist attacks against the Empire. And then there's Tarkin's greatest achievement, which was just stealing the Death Star 1 after it successfully was test-fired. As evil as director Krennic was, he actually still had some skill and ambition to build something like the Death Star in the first place. And what happens when Tarkin seizes control of the battle station? Well, he doesn't properly protect it, and so a dozen starfighters manage to blow it up. I mean, even Tarkin's contribution to Imperial defense policy, the Tarkin Doctrine, was extremely short-sighted and basically the ramblings of an unsocialized psychopath who clearly does not understand his fellow human beings. Fear 
will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. And what of the rebellion? Then there's Tarkin's destruction of Alderaan, which actually galvanizes the rebels and was a huge recruiting tool for their military. There was also that one time where a bunch of protesters were blocking Tarkin's landing pad, so he just used his warship to flatten everyone. Which of course is funny, but again, this is terrible governance. And this is the type of craziness that just trickles right down through the Imperial military command structure, which is shaped like a pyramid. When Tarkin wasn't fantasizing about getting into naked knife fights with his enlisted men and killing them, he would just basically space them through an airlock. To make matters worse, the Sith interpretation of freedom means no checks and balances and no real rules. Power is everything, and those with the power to basically seize control of things just did so. And so commanders would just abuse power in crazy ways, and they were generally able to get away with everything. It wasn't just the top brass and dark lords executing personal enemies or undesirables on the battlefield. You also had lower level leaders like this individual doing the same exact thing to their men. This created a culture where the enlisted men were fearful and distrustful of their officers, leading to bad unit cohesion and low morale, which of course can hurt the Empire's operational capabilities. The rebels were well aware of this fear that the enlisted men had, and they would oftentimes exploit this by personating officers during their covert missions. That is the point of this exercise. Then this is a drill. Is it? And do you always question the orders of a superior officer? Proceeding with Protocol 13 immediately. As individuals, we're relatively powerless, but humanity's greatest skill is its ability to socialize and organize and basically group together to achieve bigger and better things. The Sith mentality, however, embraces the darker parts of human psyche like greed, lust for power, and selfishness. This creates an extremely distrustful and dangerous environment where violence and deceit continue to feed each other in a very cyclical and chaotic way. So there you have it guys, this is why the Galactic Empire, despite appearing very functional and efficient from the outside, was actually a complete mess. The Sith ideology is very destructive and it should not be applied to any type of system uh, in your government. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.